All right. Well, again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Stephanie Bianco. I'm the Director of Career Development at the Jacobs Institute here at UC Berkeley. And I am so pleased to welcome you all here for this really special talk, an inside look at inclusive design at Microsoft, led by Bryce Johnson, Principal Researcher of Accessibility and Design. I'll say a little bit more about Bryce in a moment, but I, I wanna take a second to acknowledge that we're hosting this event during National Disability Employment Awareness Month here in the US. And in the spirit of celebrating the contributions of America's workers with disabilities and lifting up practices that truly benefit each and every one of us, we're delighted for Bryce to share with us the incredibly important and inspiring work he and his team are doing at Microsoft to foster a more inclusive and accessible world. Um, Bryce is an inclusive designer for Microsoft devices where he's devoted to ensuring Microsoft products are accessible. Bryce co-created the Inclusive Tech Lab at Microsoft, which you're seeing right there. <laughs> Uh, which has now hosted over 15,000 visitors, 15,000. It's a facility where people can explore how people with disabilities interact with Microsoft products and services. He strives to design systems of accessibility enhancement like the Surp Surface Adaptive Kit across Microsoft devices. Bryce is one of the inventors of the Xbox Adaptive Controller and a proud member of the Microsoft Adaptive Accessories team. It's truly my honor to welcome you, Bryce. Thank you so much for joining us. We can't wait to learn with you today and I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you. And thank you for the kind invitation. Um, and you know, I, I am gonna start in this corner of the Inclusive Tech Lab because uh, you know, this is part of the tour that we won't get to today, um, but I wanted to make, it's always a big hit. So this is our sensory corner in the Inclusive Tech Lab. So this is where if you've ever heard of a snoozeland room or a sensory room, this is sort of our take on it. I am not a therapist. When people ask me, what, how does this apply to Microsoft products? My answer is genuinely, I don't know. Like, you know, I, I just know that there's an underserved area when it comes to sensory stimulation in um, the products that we make and how we sort of think about it. Um, one of the things I like to kind of talk to um, my design team and, and others and anyone who will kind of listen in here is, you know, we all have experienced the evolution of computers from tools to items of consumer luxury to these everyday things that are around us. And I, I wonder about the, the notion of like, can my computer actually help me make me feel better besides being able to watch cat videos on it? So, you know. That's what this, this is about. We are looking at um, our sensory space and it's always a big hit. We had kids in here like a few hours ago and they were like, you know, it was, it was always really fun. So I wanted, to, I wanted to address it, but I'm gonna go to a different part of the room. And just so, and I apologize in advance for the seasickness that will inevitably happen as I move around the room today. Um, I'm, you know, I'm really, thankful because I'm going to give you all a talk that I've never given before, which is kind of cool. And I want to make sure that you can see that screen. So um, we're going to start with our journey with the Xbox Adaptive Controller. Okay. Um, it really is the start of how we kind of got to our practice here. And everyone thinks, you know, from the Super Bowl ad that the adaptive controller was made for kids. I will tell you, no one in Xbox thinks about children. Um, they are all gamers, you know, so we all just kind of think about gamers. We don't really think about children. Um, so I remember after the Super Bowl ad, everyone was like, oh, it's so great what you did for those kids. And I had to tell them, well, we didn't do it for kids. The marketing did it for kids. Um, where we started... Um, and I'm gonna, let's play this video. So if you folks can see this, all right, this is Sergeant Josh Price. And Josh is who we met first. And we met him in 2015. He came um, with a man named Matt Height, who at the time was working for a charity called Warfighter Engaged. And Matt brought us, met Josh, and also a guy named Ken Jones, who is the guy who ran Warfighter Engage. That's Ken there. Um, and one of the things that we, that Josh and Ken really showed us, and it was really, really very impactful, um, was basically that our beloved Xbox controller, right? 
Um, you know, this is the uh, Xbox controller. This is the greatest controller that you can get. Your opinions may vary, but they'd be wrong. This is the best. This is the best controller. Um, and our beloved Xbox controller, though, was optimized over so many generations that it unintentionally excluded folks. Okay. And so what do I mean by that? How does it unintentionally exclude folks? Well, this thing's been designed around a primary use case that makes a ton of assumptions, right? It assumes that I have two hands to hold it. It assumes that I have two thumbs for these sticks, that I have a fluid range of motion to get to these bump, these buttons. Game designers sometimes assume that people can hit multiple buttons at the same time. Um, this controller assumes that I have the reach with my index finger to get to these bumpers and triggers. And it assumes that I have the strength and endurance to hold it. And when we worked with guys like Josh, I should have put that on repeat. Um, when we worked with guys like Josh, it was really very obvious that, you know, we'd made a controller that wasn't for him, right? That he, and so what Ken would do is Ken would take these, and, and it wasn't just Ken. There are lots of people around the world that have kind of followed this route where they'd take our controller They'd crack it open, they'd solder wires to it, they'd hook it up to external things, and they'd kind of make it work. And um, so once we saw Josh, and once we started talking with vets, actually, I'll show you another vet. Um, I'm going to show you a guy named Corporal Todd Nicely. Actually, I think he's gotten a promotion since then. Um, but I just want you to know, before I show you, um, Todd's a quad amputee, so don't be shocked. Okay, <laughs> so, so this is Todd. So you can see that Todd is a quad amputee and he also had a rig from Warfighter Engaged. And he, you know, he's playing with all his limbs, um, legs, you know, everything. You can kind of see what he's, what he's kind of playing with there. And that modularity was, was really important. So I will say that in retrospect, when we started making this controller, we all knew why we had to do it. You know, we talked to these vets, everyone on the team was like, oh, we got to do this. It just makes sense. We recognized that we were creating an exclusion. Um, and actually, that's a good segue to this. Can folks see that? Those are our inclusive design principles. Okay. So we recognize, and I can send these to you too. Like if they're actually, they're, if you can read that URL, they're microsoft.com slash design slash inclusive is the URL. And you can find all this information up there. But the first principle of our inclusive design methodology is recognize exclusion. And so we had to recognize that our beloved Xbox controller was designed around a primary use case that unintentionally excluded people. And so that was the, the motivation for us to go do the adaptive controller. We recognize that exclusion because we learn from diversity, which is the second principle. We met Todd, we met Ken, we met Josh, right? And then as we developed the Xbox Adaptive Controller, we worked with a bunch of other charities. We worked with Able Gamers, Special Effect in the UK, Cerebral Palsy Foundation. We worked with Craig Hospital out of Denver. And then we worked with Warfighter, who were, were the, the first people we worked with. And we also had about 75 external beta um, advisors with us as we kind of develop the various versions of the controller. Now I will tell you if you're very if you're familiar at all with like um, consumer electronic development, it's very secretive. So the fact that we had 75 external people from the very first off the line prototypes was really quite unheard of, but it's very important to our to the way that we work because we learn from diversity. This principle is the is the, it, the way that we look at this is this is our obligation to the idea of nothing about us without us, right? We design with the community, not for the community. That's at least the goal, right? And you know, it's pretty hard. We're a big place. I don't wanna say that we like always nail it, but at least we know what we're aiming for. And then that last principle there, the solve for one, extend to many. That idea is basically when it started in our inclusive design methodology was the idea that if you solve for someone, say like um, Josh, who has one hand, you know, you can solve for someone who has temporarily one handed, like say someone with like a, um, like a broken arm. And you can solve for someone who 
is situationally one-handed, like if they're holding a baby, or if you're in Seattle, you're holding a cup of coffee, one-handed, right? So, you know, that's one way of looking at solve for one extend to many. I will say that over the years of, of doing this practice, I tend to think about now, a lot more now about the interrelated needs of disability and how we actually design products to, to meet more than one sort of facet of disability. And so what I mean by that is it's really clear to me, I'm actually gonna go back to, I'm gonna go back to Josh for a second. Oh, actually, let's do this. Um, so there's Josh and Zach, and there's the, our announcement video, that's Jonah, and, and that's uh, John there. Um, so all different types of disabilities. Uh, Josh, uh, amputee, Zach, cerebral palsy, Jonah, spinal cord injury, and uh, John here has um, cerebral palsy, Dif milder form of CP than Zach does. Um, so when we started the development of the adaptive controller, that was kind of our wheelhouse, those conditions. Limb difference, quadriplegia, cerebral palsy. So basically, we were creating a controller for people who don't have fine motor control. And this thing requires fine motor control. And we did that by you know, creating a modular device so that we can do things like put different joysticks. This is a joystick on a stand. We can put modular other joysticks like this guy and, and things like switches. So we can put a switch where you have movement. So the reason why it's called the adaptive controller and the reason why we have kind of called all our products adaptive is that we're trying to make these things adapt to you, not you to it. Right. That's that's the that's the goal and how we sort of think about our process and how we think about that work here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's where we started from, from a hardware perspective. I will say that we've done lots of work with inclusive design from a software perspective. And what the challenge is, you know, I will tell you, too, like when we started our inclusive design practice, you're all at Berkeley. This is this is kind of funny, the home of universal design. Uh, you know, uh, we were a little snarky against a simplistic idea against what universal design was. And I can say that now after a lot of years. So if you think about how universal design is often presented, which is like one size extending to many or one, one thing that works for everybody, we were really kind of against that idea. And that's a very simplistic view of universal design. I realize this now, you know, I had it wrong. Right. Um, but we, cause so we were always, because we were immersed in software, we were thinking about things like we want one size to fit one, right? We don't want an extra large t-shirt and hit for everybody. We want like things to fit and fit was always a very important sort of part of how we thought about it. Software does not have to have a fixed form, right? There's no reason for software to have a fixed form other than the fact that it takes time to code and design lots of different forms, right? But as someone who built web pages in the 90s, they are built very differently now. You know, they are, it is not the same practice at all. So, you know, that was where we kind of came from, this idea of fluidity, flexibility. And when I came over to hardware, um, it became tricky, right? Um, atoms are not bits. Hardware has form. Things don't bend, but you know, well, some things bend, but like, I think we were trying to figure out how to apply this practice. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk to you about how some principles of how I, how I've been thinking about this. So new stuff. And I got to adjust. Sorry, I'm going to move all around the room today. So I was saying earlier, uh, I don't have slides because we're just, everything I, I would show in slides, I have like right here. So why would I do that? <laughs> um, so, you know, so I'm gonna talk to you today about how I look at this and these are gonna be my slides. So the way that I think about this is I think about building spectrums of interaction between devices, accessories, and augmentations. Right. So 
We as people interact with computers in infinite ways across infinite contexts, and also infinite functions of human diversity. We're striving to tailor adaptive systems of input and output that fit, that will empower the disabled, right? That's our, that's our sort of goal, devices, accessories, augmentations. Here's my next slide, what we believe. Um, and I'm showing you this, sorry for the reflection. Let's try to get rid of that. Um, this, is my, this is my friend Tyler, who recently passed. Tyler was super important to us. Um, he was uh, you know, just a, a wonderful community member and basically like, was with us through so many things. So you know, I really wanna make sure that we honor Tyler. Um, so what we believe, we believe that modern products provide experiences that intertwine the digital and physical. We believe to meet the needs of human diversity, we must approach product design, striving to create flexible systems through a lens of devices, accessories, and augmentations, right? So I'm gonna hit that one a lot. So let me go through the first principle of what I kind of think of when I think about this new framework that we're trying to develop. Okay, awareness is essential. People with disabilities are the true experts on the barriers they face, 100%, yet they might not always be aware of the solutions or designs that can help them overcome or eliminate those barriers. So what does that mean? Um, I've met a lot of people with disabilities over the years and they know what they can't do and that they know what they can't do in the context of what everyone else does, right? But it's tricky to think about, it's tricky to ask them to basically make up solutions. So what I mean by that, so um, one of the, one of the um, sort of people who really influenced us in our original inclusive design um, work was a woman named Susan Goltzman. Um, she actually designed parks in the Bay Area, um, inclusive parks. Um, and what Susan said was, you can't have inclusive design without, without engaging the community. The community is there from the very beginning. But you can't put the responsibility of designing onto basically non-designers, right? The community's there to inform you but it is ultimately designers' responsibility to meet those needs. And I really believe that because what happens when you are just engaging the community and you're getting their raw feedback and you're going away and not synthesizing that into something better, you're basically just checking off bugs on a list, right? And you're approaching it like, like an engineer would, not, nothing against engineers, um, but like you're approaching it like an engineer would in the sense of like, well, what's the problem? What's the solution? Chick, chick, you know, whereas we try to spend some time and synthesize these solutions that are out there in the world. Now, the trick with that, though, and for us, the trick here at Microsoft is trying to find the right level that we can work at. Right. So what I mean by that is, you know, I showed you a bunch of folks. Um, with the adaptive controller, tetraplegics, you know, cerebral palsy, limb difference. We didn't make a solution for limb difference. We didn't make a solution for like tetraplegics. We, we made a solution that tried to meet the needs of a bunch of them because it's, it's not really possible for us to go super niche, even though that, that is, you know, I'm very thankful when people do go super niche. So we try to have to sit at a layer like a, you know, it's not like 10,000 feet, but it's not 1,000 feet, it's probably like, you know, five or 6,000 feet. But the trick with that is then when we come up with these solutions and we synthesize these things, um, we're creating new things. And they're not necessarily intuitive, you know, intuitive by definition, right? Um, I always, always quote um, Jeff Raskin, um, you know, Jeff Raskin, original designer of Mac OS, um, the Mac OS, um, who said, when people say intuitive, they mean familiar, right? And I think that, I really do believe that. Like, you know, 
um, when someone says something's intuitive, it's because they've encountered something like it before and they know what to kind of do, right? So when we're creating these products for people, um, it can get a little unintuitive because we're asking people to kind of come with us on this journey. So raising awareness um, of the products that we create is actually just as important as creating the products. And, and I, to be completely honest with you, we're not great at that second part. You know, we're product makers, um, but product evangelism in this world is, is just as vital. If, you know, because you make it and you need to kind of go out in the world. And so the reason why I'm saying that here is this is all the parts of our new adaptive accessory system. So let me, there's a whole bunch of, of stuff, right? So, you know, there's our um, adaptive mouse, right? Tiny little mouse made for folks with muscular dystrophy, 45 grams, wireless, battery, small, right? Highly sensitive, six times more sensitive than a typical mouse. So someone who has very little strength can move this thing a few millimeters and, you know, have a fully functioning mouse. But the thing about mice in real life is that mice have tails and so do ours. So I'm going to like press this button and I'm going to pop off the back and I'm going to take a tail. This is the tail that we make. And now that looks a lot more like you would expect a mouse to look like, right? This one's uh, right-handed because it has the support. Uh, not really ergonomic, but you know, it's all right. But now it's left-handed, right? Pop it around, move things around. But because of this system, through 3D printing, we can start to do a lot. So, you know, the designer of the mouse has a daughter with cerebral palsy. And she basically has, her fingers will tremble when she's, got her, when she's got her hand on a mouse here, and her fingers would fall off the mouse buttons. Her cerebral palsy in that trembling would also cause her to accidentally hit mice buttons. So what her dad did was he designed this mouse and this tail. So this snaps on just like I showed you. There's extra plastic there. It makes it harder for her to press the buttons. There are grooves that her fingers sit in so they'll stop them from falling off the mouse. He blocks the wheel so that she doesn't accidentally hit it. And on the bottom, on her thumb support, there's these little dimples and these dimples grip the table. They make the mouse harder to move across the surface. And that resistance gives her precision, okay? So that's how that works with the mouse. But as you can kind of see from this box of stuff, there's a lot, you know? If I were to tell you that this was a button, you'd be like, no, no, it isn't. But it is. It's a button that you actually use with your chin. Right? So we have to do, and, and we've, we've learned a lot, but I think there's a lot more for us to kind of learn in the sense that it's really important for us to not only put out support materials and how-tos about the devices and how they work, but to engage the disability community, to have them tell their stories. And with the adaptive accessories, we actually did a video um, around last holiday where um, we had three creators, one with um, spinal muscular atrophy, one who was limb different, and an another one who is nonverbal cerebral palsy, um, tell, tell stories of how they use the adaptive accessories, how they use them to empower them. Because these examples are vital to have us sort of change people's ideas of how they can be included in, in the products that, that are, we make and the, and the digital experiences. Because, you know, I mean, we're not trying to get people to adapt to a certain type of mouse or keyboard. We're trying to create a mouse or keyboard that kind of works for them. Cool. I'm going to move on to the next one. Okay. And I'm going to talk a bit more about the adaptive accessories. And I'm going to move the, 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 I'm going to move the cart again. Okay, tilt up. Actually, I might just go a little higher. There we go. So we're going to talk about, this is the hub. This is the adaptive accessories hub. 
and I'm sorry, let's see if I can get that screen. You'll, you'll, have to, you'll have to believe me, this is the configuration software for the, uh, it, I know it's really hard to see. But this next um, sort of idea in our, our toolkit is basically this one, okay? Configuration is augmentation. Contemporary products blend physical and digital experiences. Personalization emerges through configuration. Accessibility can be personalization that accommodates human diversity, okay? So, you know, that's something I, I really do believe, like all accessibility really is, is personalization that accommodates human diversity. Um, and that makes it sound really easy, even though it isn't, you know, like we, we're still kind of always striving. So, you know, the, this is the configuration UI. So I've got basically this, um, this hub, I've got a button in here and I, and through this configuration UI, I can make this button do anything that a mouse or keyboard can do. Right. And I can do it in a macro. And so, um, and I can do a very complicated macro. So let me actually tell you what a simple macro is. So, um, I know people who have cerebral palsy and when they're on teams calls, they can't navigate using a trackball or a joystick or whatever they use for a cursor up to the UI to hit mute or camera fast enough, right? You know, when they want to mute, you know, when you want to mute, you want to do it quickly. You don't want to like it take a few minutes. So what we do is we take this button and we tell the hub through the configuration software that when this button's pressed, it throws a control shift M and a control shift O. And in Teams, I don't know what it is in Zoom, I haven't tried it, um, you know, in Teams, that will turn the camera on and the mic on, okay? So, you know, all of a sudden, instead of like navigating with your cursor up and clicking those things in the UI, hit this button, throw keyboard shortcuts, mic, mic on, camera on. And, you know, um, the people that I'm talking about can't do a three key keyboard shortcut ever. Um, and the thing about the, the hub in this configuration is that we can tell this device to do that keyboard command with this button, those two keyboard commands with this button in Teams. And when you're in another program, you can have this button do something completely else. And that's a simple macro. So, you know, other things that we could do, we think a lot about acceleration. We're trying to accelerate people's tasks, right? So... Another person, and one of the ones that I was telling you about, the, the person who is nonverbal cerebral palsy that did some promotional material for us, um, they use eye gaze on their computer. So they use an eye tracker to basically like um, navigate their Windows PC. And eye tracking, if you've ever seen someone use eye tracking, the thing that I think is that we don't talk about enough as a community is eye tracking is very tiring. It takes a lot out of you. So... When they're using eye tracking, they, um, you know, they get tired. And to navigate using your eyes down to the taskbar to switch the application you're in is just, is just a lot of work. So for this person, we told them we, they have a head array on their wheelchair that they use um, that they can basically bang their head on, you know, that mouse, right? And um, that's funny. I forgot it was set to something. <laughs> I might switch back. That's hilarious. I don't even know what it's set to. Oh, it's, it's set to a macro that I had programmed. Uh, so um, what we had this person do was a macro where if they hit the button, um, it does a Windows 1, which will take you to the first program in your taskbar. Now, our macro language also allows for you to put pauses in a macro, which can become really powerful. So now all of a sudden, we have this guy who's basically doing Windows 1, pause, Windows 2, pause, Windows 3, pause, Windows 4, pause, and then it loops back around, right? So he can hit this button, and every time he hits it, it goes to the next program on his taskbar, and then it loops back around. So he doesn't have to use his energy just switching apps when he doesn't have to. So we're accelerating that movement. And, and that's a more complicated macro, but it can get way more complicated. So the thing about all these options, right, and what we, what we think about, you know, you know I, I've worked on Windows for 10 years. People come up to me all the time 
and they go, you know what would be great in Windows? This. And then I go, that's been in Windows for five years, a lot of times, right? So I know Windows is complicated. So as designers, we have to find the balance between, you know, and again, I, I, I feel this is a, an exercise of synthesis, right? I, I will get back to synthesis a lot because I do really think it's vital to how we think about our work. Um, you know, you, you have to find the balance between providing the options that people need to, ch to achieve what they kind of want to do, but also not overwhelming them with too many settings. I've talked to a lot of disability advocates that are just like, just give us all the settings. I want every, every setting. And I go, no, you don't like, and I basically have to kind of go take it from someone who works on windows. You don't want all the settings, right? You don't just want to be overwhelmed by them. So, you know, that's something that, believe it or not, we think about a <laughs> ton. Okay, cool. That's two. Three more to go. All right? We're, do we're doing all right. We're doing good for time. I'm going to move us around the room once more. See, this was the part where you would have seen that in the background, and if I didn't tell you about it, you'd be like, what is that? <laughs> So, all right, this next principle. Okay, adjustments are augmentation, okay? Ergonomics began during World War II, adapting equipment designed to human capacities for better efficiency and safety. Products designed to be adjusted provide built-in augmentation. So, um, I don't know if anyone knows the whole ergonomics, World War II origin story of human factors. Um, but basically, I'll try to do it as, as quickly as I can. So please forgive me if I go over anything really quick uh, in a not the greatest way. Um, the Air Force was designing planes. They were designing planes for the average pilot, right? And planes were crashing. And some a scientist came out and basically said, yeah, and did measurements of all the pilots. And even though, and none of the pilots, of like hundreds and hundreds of pilots, none of them fit, fit the average pilot. So literally when you were designing for the average pilot, you were designing for no one, okay? And so that is where this idea of, that's where modern ergonomics basically sort of started. That's why you don't buy a car that's like small, medium, or large right? Like your seats adjust, your steering wheels adjust, right? Because people have these needs. So that type of augmentation is really very vital to, I think, how we, we design products. So, you know, I think, I think adjustability, you know, it, it is really important because you have to think about comfort. You have to think about productivity. You've got to think about you know, all, all sorts of things. So I would encourage you all to just think about adjustability in the things that you make as a way to make your products more accessible and, and include a, a, a diverse set of disabilities. So the examples that I kind of have here, I don't have a ton in here, but like the one I want to kind of show is we have our kickstand on our Surface Pro device so that it can be set at, a, at an angle. And this angle could be because you can't see the screen because of glare. This angle could be just because how you sit. But this is an example of adjustability you know, I think another one here is I have this like uh, this other surface on a on a stand, right? But um, those types of adjustability are, are really important. We have one in our controllers. We have tension adjustment um, in our Elite uh, controller. You can make the sticks stiffer or or you know standard. I wish you could, they could go lighter, but but you know we, we we're doing our best. So uh, you know that that's a really important one. So adjustability is a really important one for folks. Cool. Let's move on. I know I said I wasn't doing a tour, but this is kind of a tour. It's just a different kind of tour. Um, okay. I want you to, I'm going to make sure I see this one. Okay. Next one. Sophisticated and straightforward approaches. The disabled have a rich history of augmenting objects to fit their needs Embracing accessibility through innovation. Quality modifications, not necessarily high tech, are there, is their rightful expectation. Okay. 
Remember how I talked about fit? Like fit. And sometimes fit is, is you know, can be really simple. It can just be, it, it can be very, very simple. Um, but I think, I think what we've seen in the disability community is that people would augment their, their devices in a number of ways that might, aren't necessarily um, as elegant as they deserve. So what's an example of that? Um, we would see people out in the world that would put crazy glue on their keyboard keys to denote a specific key so that it had a tactile affordance. Blind folks would put um, crazy glue on a keyboard key because they're like, I need to know where this key is. I need this key to feel different. Or, or furniture bumps. And the problem with like furniture bumps is that if you put furniture bumps on a laptop, you might not close the screen properly. And then all of a sudden you're baking your laptop in your bag and you're wearing down the battery. So the need is there, but they sh we should, we should um, create these things so that people have something that's elegant. So we created a little while ago, we created the Surface Adaptive Kit. Okay. Sorry, right here. You can look that up, Surface Adaptive Kit. Um, it's a set of aftermarket adaptations that enhance the function for people with disabilities while staying true to the elegance of the Surface form. It's a pack of stickers. That's what it is. It's a pack of stickers, okay? But they're really cool stickers. So let's talk about those stickers. Let's talk about modern laptops for a second. Modern laptops are super thin because why would anyone want a thick, heavy laptop, right? But the thing about thinness is that it requires fingertip dexterity to be able to open. So we have a pull that we made for our Surface laptops for people who don't have finger dexterity so that they can basically like get leverage to pull this open. And we saw this in a number of different ways. We just made one that felt right, you know, would last a long time. You can be confident enough to hold it like this, you know, from it. So that's one of the aspects of the Surface Adaptive Kit. Another one, let's, I think if you guys can see this. So I have this cable marker on this, on this uh, cord. So these are brightly colored, but they're also um, tactily distinct where we can mark a cable with a, with a label and then the corresponding port so that you can find them really easily. This cable goes in this port, they feel the same. Um, again, so while that one is for people who didn't have like fine motor fingertip control, this is another one for, for um, our friends who have limited vision. Um, other labels that we have. So these are brightly colored tactile bumps that go on our Surface keyboard. And you can put these wherever you want to get the tactile affordance you need. And you can be confident that they'll stay on there, that they'll last a long time, that your laptop will be able to close, and that they feel pretty good. These are the brightly colored ones. We also have a set in the kit that are translucent because blind people, some blind people didn't want to advertise that they had stuff on their, on their keyboard keys. So as we kind of go forward, it's important to think about that. Um, this one here is, is fun because this is a, a button on this keyboard I've purposely blocked the the icon this is the lock button so if i press this button it's going to lock my computer so sometimes these can be used for keys that you really want to know where they are not just because you use them because you don't want to use them right so you can kind of do that too and other aspects of like straightforward and simple approaches you know you can see i've got this surface pro on this stand right and one of the things that we've observed a lot in the world is that People, I don't know, people kind of want uh, people with disabilities to change their behavior or, or certain behaviors might not be considered, I, I don't know, I, I, ideal. So what I mean by what we're doing here is that like, you know, if you can't see something on your screen, it's completely natural to put your face closer to the screen, right? Like move your face closer to it. But if you've got a laptop, you might not want to be sniffing what you had for lunch on your fingers by shoving your face close to that screen, right? 
So let's put it on a stand. Let's put it in a better posture. Let's use a Bluetooth keyboard. We don't have to, we don't have, to have this classic clamshell form. It's not required. It's, even for portability, I mean, this stand folds down. It's really easy. So uh, again, like how are we thinking about these augmentations in ways that are really just very simple and straightforward? Um, lastly, I want to talk a bit about, um, you know, these pens. Um, these are something that we've just talked or we've just released um, out into the world is a set of 3D printable pen grips. And so, you know, the way that I think about this is that inclusive design shapes forms to fit individuals and not the other way around, right? Um, we started these pen grips for people who didn't have fine motor finger control. So, you know, our wheelhouse is tetraplegics and cerebral palsy because that's where we've, we've done a lot of work. So if you don't have the ability to, to grip something with like your fingertips, you've got a big grip here. But what we found, which has been extremely gratifying, um, is that we found a few people who have a condition called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Is anyone familiar with that? It's, it's pretty rare, but I mean, you're starting to hear a lot more about it now. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is basically um, a condition that makes the tissue and muscles in your body stretchy. And the reason why that can be, um, can be hard on folks, and someone explained this to me, and they gave me this, this metaphor, which I really like. Um, if you think about a motor that has a belt, right? Like for a gear, and that belt starts to stretch, it's gonna make your motor less efficient. It'll still probably work, but it's not gonna work well. And so when, you're, when, you're, when your tissue and your muscles um, don't have that tension, you can't do things like grip stuff. So we would see folks with Ehlers-Danlos who couldn't press on the tip of a pen to hold it. And having a grip like this just gives them the ability to just place it in their hand and let their hand cup around it. You know, and that was something that was, was really powerful for us to kind of understand and figure out. Um, these ones are bright blue. I will tell you the person that I was working with that had um, Ehlers-Danlos was a college student. And at first um, I gave her a bright blue one. And then like in a few months I found out she wasn't using it because like, dude, like no one wants a bright blue pen in their classroom. So I got her a black one. <laughs> so, you know, lesson learned, right? <laughs> you know, so again, simple, straightforward, but sophisticated, not cheap not homemade. We're not trying to be Etsy. Not to disparage anyone who does Etsy stuff. Okay. Um, so I've been talking a lot about, I'm going to move this down a bit. See this next one. And maybe tilt that. Oh, well, that's probably too much. I'm going to stare at my beard. Okay. Um, I do want to talk about this idea because I've been talking a lot about configuration and all this stuff. Physical augmentation is not required. I don't want to imply that you, everything that we design has to be, you have to think about like how it can be augmented. Um, there's definitely needs for things that are purpose-built, right? And where I said that Microsoft sits at this like 5,000 foot level, I'm very, very thankful that not everyone's like us, right? So this is, um, this is a humanware Brilliant 20, okay? So this is um, a Braille reader for people who, a refreshable braille display for blind folks who read braille that connects to your computer and through your screen reader basically, um, instead of, if you've heard a screen reader basically orally tell people what's on the screen, this will convert it to braille. Um, the user basically runs their finger along this and they read it and they go back to the beginning. This is a 20 line one. Um, this is a 40 line one, so it's bigger, right? So the thing about Braille, and I'm no expert on Braille. I can't demo this because I don't read Braille. Um, you know, 
uh, eight dots in Braille, right? Each character, eight dots. And then these corresponding eight keys up there are to type Braille back. So output, input, okay? Um, the thing about these devices is that they're so important to the people that use them, this is more important and likely more expensive than the computer that they're using it on. Like, and they will keep these for a long time, but these are super important. But, you know, I, I do want to stress again, like, these need to exist, right? Like, no one wants me to, like, show up and make, like, one of these and go, hey, you just need to 3D print something. No, forget that. This needs to, like, exist as it kind of is. And there are lots of really great examples kind of out there in the world uh, of, of specialty products that need to exist. But it is... It is like, how do you find, how do you find those? And so it comes back to awareness, right? Um, and then there probably are still ways that some people might augment these. Um, there's definitely ways to configure them, right? So configuration is super important on, on those devices. And, you know, it really does kind of make it important to think about these ecosystems of devices, accessories, and augmentations that kind of branch out in a bunch of different ways so that someone has the opportunity to, to create something that fits them, right? That's, that's sort of the goal. Cool. Does that make sense? How am I doing? I got a few minutes. All right. I got, I've got a few takeaways. What you can do, and this is hard. I should send these along. I know you can't see these. <laughs> so the first thing that I really encourage people to do is to continuously engage the disabled. Participate in communities, understanding a breadth of challenges will guide your designs, and personal experience is never enough. And I put that in there because I work with a lot of people who kind of think like they can represent kind of everybody, and that's not true, <laughs> you know, right? It just isn't, you know, I think, uh, again, as designers, you know, you need to go out and get as much information as you possibly can. Um, design to extend to many. So what I think about this one is products don't exist in isolation. So consider your design within a larger ecosystem of use. Um, assume augmentations will be needed by someone, which I still think is fair. Publish examples. Showcase product utility with disabled user demonstrations. Show how your product addresses interrelated needs across disability. So instead of thinking about tetraplegia, cerebral palsy, limb difference, think about a lack of fine motor control, interrelated need across disability, right? Think about that stuff. Share success stories. Amplify the voices of those who found empowerment through devices, accessories, and augmentations. Their narratives can inspire others and offer insights into potential improvements. And so that is a toolkit in a form of a presentation that I'm, I'm looking at to extending our Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit, specifically for hardware. <laughs> we actually um, also recently published an extension. Christina Mallon and a bunch of other folks here at Microsoft published an extension of the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit, specifically around cognitive scenarios. It's, it's very good, it's very well done. It's, it's a little heady for me, it's a little bit of a head scratcher. I'm not really the academic that I probably should be. Um, but you know, it's all good. Um, I would love to take some questions if anyone has any. I know, hopefully we have enough time and I can stay late. Oh, baby. <laughs> <laughs>